So, getting this thing started, um, how would you describe what exactly it is that you do and why do you do it? Hmm. I sort of say I just talk about awakening, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I guess um, people use me sort of like a, a mentor or a teacher, I guess. Um, so I have a YouTube channel where I just talk about things that I think that my clients would like, and if it reaches a wider audience, then that's awesome as well. But I guess I cater towards my clients and questions that arise with them. But it's basically about non-duality, you could say, and helping people that are um, going through a pretty intense, intense awakening. Most of them are pretty, um, been doing it a long time and wanting to get it done, wanting to get through it as quickly as possible. And yes, yeah, so I, I try and offer my help. <laughs> That's awesome. So how would you describe what this, <clears throat> excuse me, this awakening or non-dual perspective is really about in a simplistic manner. And I know it truly does go beyond description, but if we can try and get into it, how would you, you know, how would you describe that in a, in a simple way? I think it's mostly about identity. So an identity shift, you could say. So it's going from believing you're a separate person named whatever you've been named to experientially knowing that that is not true and that all the things you've been told about yourself are not true, that's illusion. And then you're trying to discover, well, if I'm not that, then who am I? Uh -huh. And that's the awakening journey. And then the discovery of that from lived experience, not from conceptual understanding, is, um, I guess, the pathway to being awake. Mm -hmm. Well said. Uh, is that one of the most common questions or things that people come to you for? Um, it's like, well, if I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not the labels, then what am I? Is that, um, is that something that would, someone would approach you for? Yeah, that would be like a er, someone that's earlier on in the journey. I certainly get people that are there that want to know, am I going through an awakening? That's that's basically why they come to me. So they're kind of wanting a bit of, to be mapped, like where am I on this journey, which mm -hmm. is useful and I can sometimes assist with. It's not necessary to know exactly. It's if you've got an interest in it, then, you know, that's the path and you just keep going. But yeah, certainly some people just want to know, is this what's happening to me? You know, my life is kind of falling apart or these crazy things are happening and I just wanted to check in, is is this what's happening? Am I going through an awakening? Uh -huh. So some people just, just want to know that, yeah. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. So how do you describe what we are? Is it pertain to the <clears throat> special circumstances of somebody? Is it pertain to a... a an individual and how they approach you and what exactly they ask and where they are in the journey. You know, how, how do you describe the, the truly undescribable? You mean describe what we are yeah. absolute ter in absolute terms? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, you know, undescribable, but, <laughs> but I'll give it a go. So it is, that's it. <laughs> yeah keep it at that <laughs> yeah i like it <laughs> to be more accurate it's just it's what the mind can't understand mm. um because it's outside of it so it's beyond language so we can't describe it we can only point to it saying that it's empty saying that it's silent saying that it's aware saying that it's eternal we can point to uh, attributes that it has, but uh, we can never really speak about it in any clear way because we have to experience it. We have to. And so I try to really avoid talking about it as much as possible and, and work towards helping people to experience it through mm. self-inquiry and meditation and practices because there's really not that much point talking about it. 
Yeah, I agree. Mm hmm. Because then um, one can mistake the moon for the finger pointing at the moon, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the classic metaphor we all know. Um, so, what would you say is the most um, efficient way or technique? And I know there's no cookie cutter response to that. Um, but if we can try and talk about it, maybe point somebody in a general direction, would you say it's meditation, like a general meditation and we're or really just like maybe general curiosity at what all of this is, what we are? Um, yeah. What would you say? I think a combination of self-inquiry, which means different things, but I can go into that if you like, um, mixed with some type of emotional work, like sort of like therapy work on a psychological level mm -hmm. um, is a great combination. And so I sort of work with those two things combined mostly, but I find that that helps to, because we awaken on the level of the mind and the heart and of, on the body and so I try to incorporate things that, that have all of those things. So we're feeling into the sensations, into the contractions. We're feeling into the emotions. We're looking at the beliefs and the identity. So we look at all the levels, then it's just in the process of waking up on all levels. So, oh, I so yeah. See. yeah, rather so than just focusing on mind stuff, mm -hmm. which is great and can get you to that first mind awakening, but then you might be limited as to how far you go. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So you examine all levels, all layers yeah. um, within the one layer, I guess you could say, the layers in, in the layer, the waves in the ocean, right? Yeah. That, I, that allows somebody to um, see through the layers and how they all, I guess, work together in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the giant cake, I guess you could say, of the being, <laughs> you know, the different, the different, um, levels i guess one could say of who we are the one the one layer like i said is that what you're getting at yeah because it's like one system is how i see it so you can't if you just focus on mind stuff which is very important for awakening of course it's it's a large part of it but if you just focus on that um i just think you can stop your progress later on down the track mm. mm -hmm. hmm. yeah so you said, um, you mentioned something about self-inquiry, right? And you said we can get into that. So yeah, how would you describe what that is? Is that, I mean, are we already on that track kind of? Well, I, like all of our language, I guess everyone uses it differently and that's where it gets confusing. And there's like the traditional, like, who am I, Ramana Mahashi style, which is useful for sure. But I sort of say self-inquiry, I break it sort of into a couple of parts really. Um, so there's the who am I part to it, which is trying to get an experience of of who we are. So whether we say who am I, what am I, where am I, but we're trying to activate an experience of our true essence, you could say, in those questions. Then there's also a part of inquiry where we where I find it's very useful to look for the illusions as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the opposite side to that. So it's like, where is the me? Where is the separate self here? Where is the one that's talking? Where's the doer? Where's the knower? Let me find that one in my experience right now. So I feel like it's there, but is it actually there? Mm -hmm. And constantly looking for it and investigating it and seeing what's it made up of, this, this sense of a me, when I actually go into it, what is it made up of? Can I find it? So I find that to be very useful to do both of those. So it sort of like can work like, I'm looking for the me and I can't find it and I examine and I examine and I don't locate it. And so the next logical question is, well, if I'm not that, then who am I? So it kind of like goes in a cycle like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we got to know what we're not in order to know what we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like netty netty. Yeah, I'm yeah. not this, I'm not that. And then, mm -hmm. but some people leave it there so that you can get stuck many steps along the way. So it's great to find out what you're not, but it's more important to then examine, well, well who am I? Mm -hmm. You know, that's really the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like we said before, that, that true answering of that question 
it's it's actually unanswerable right it yeah. is experienceable um there is a sort of remembrance that comes but truly it's it's not a concept it's not anything that i could convey there's no like concrete answer there's not even anything concrete in the mind but it's still and i know this is kind of contradictory to say but it's like it's still something it's not <laughs> it's something yeah. that's not something it's um yeah like i said the words don't do it justice but it's like I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> exactly. You just lose yeah. language trying to talk about it. You just sort of go like this in the end because it's like mm -hmm. you just can't explain it. Yeah. But there's something there, but it's not a thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Like, but like we said, it's it's something that we can remember. It's a yeah. wavelength. It's more almost like, it's almost like more so an energy in a way. But even that, it's still not an energy. But it's a good pointer. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. I mean, it's like this energy was something that we are connected to, we always will be, and we always were connected to. But it's not even like connection, because then connection implies two things that are, yeah. you know, coming together. But it, yeah, the words, the words, man, <laughs> you know, that's why poetry is, uh, I feel as though, um, important, because poetry, in a way goes beyond the base level meaning of words. So if you can find a very poetic or eloquent speaker or writer about these things like Rumi, mm -hmm. or maybe even, yeah, Ramana Maharshi was kind of poetic in his words. Um, but there's certain speakers that they, they just know how to use the words a lot better than I could that just like, they just hit, you know, it's kind of like the idea of Zen Kohans where it just like, it doesn't, I don't know. It's it, it works. It works a lot better than just saying things like, you know, like the classic non dual things we see online, like you don't exist. There is no self. There's nothing going on here. Like I get it. I, that stuff. I get it. I, I get it because like I've had that realization to a certain extent, but it's like, it's not that easy. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> It's not that easy to just say it. And then somebody else on the other side of the camera on the other side of the screen will be like, Oh, you know <laughs> <Not really>. yeah. <laughs> yeah but um yeah there's certain knacks and nuances i feel like to teachings and, and guiding others um to that but yeah actually ramana maharshi said i've said this previously if there's any if there's anybody that has listened before uh, ramana maharshi actually said there is no cookie cutter teaching or guidance to um this non-dual awakening it's it's like it's pertained to each person and their individual circumstances and how they approach you and if they're truly sincere in their journey. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to this thing. Um, but there's really not, uh, <laughs> there's, I, how am I trying to say this? I'm kind of getting lost in my words. It's like, there's, um, it's just important to be wise as a teacher. I feel like, uh, as a guider, you could say, or as just somebody who's a facilitator to, it's, it's important to be, wise with our words you know choose wisely um because if not i feel like it could i don't know i'm not in that space you could you could you could probably speak to a lot more than i can but i feel like if one doesn't choose their words wisely and the guidance to others that are seeking um it could lead the seeking even more it could be detrimental to one seeking you know what i mean mm -hmm. it can like someone can get lost in somebody's words and getting back to it they can mistake the finger for the moon, you know, and um, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> that's that's not good. But um, yeah, do you, do you feel the same way? Do you feel as though like um, there has to be a certain kind of nuance and knack to somebody's words when when guiding others along on the path? I think there's a lot of responsibility in being a let's Definitely call it a guide. Responsibility, yeah. And although there's no person here, so there's no such thing as personal responsibility and we can spiritualize it all we like, at the end of the day there is <laughs> a felt sense of responsibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um and so I I try to take that as seriously as I can and be as ethical as I can and choose my words very carefully and you'll get shown when you work with people over and over again how your words, a single word can impact someone yeah. um, in, a, in a bad way. And so it really keeps you in this very um, sort of 
to high standards, I, I feel like anyway. Well, that's how it works for me. And I like that. I'm I'm glad that I'm held accountable um mm. for my actions and for my teachings. So yeah, and it's it's a constantly evolving process because you're always learning and every new person you work with, they have a different unfolding. It's truly unique and yet many of the same processes and techniques work with a large majority of people. So there's like it's a bit of a paradox, um, the whole unfolding, because there are certain checkpoints that everyone goes through, but everyone unfolds in a very unique way as well. And so it's a constant learning process that I feel like I'll be learning forever just because each time I work with someone new, I learn new things, I learn how they work differently, and, yeah, it makes it really an interesting job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to say the least, it's definitely interesting. Mm -hmm. In yogic philosophy, they, they say, always the student. I try to keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Mm -hmm. Always the student. Um. Yeah, so why would you say that you do this work? Is it just like an effortless thing that just, you know, where did this all come from to become uh, an online personality or somebody that you do online sat songs from? Like where where do you say this stems from in, in your being? Is it just, you know, just something that you feel as though is just natural? It just kind of happened. I guess it's, it's a pretty vague answer, but I was working, I, I started an online business about eight years ago, more in the metaphysical realm, like a psychic and past life aggressionist and all this, and like a coach, like a spiritual guide and so similar stuff, but not talking about awakening. And then over time, as I was going deepening with my own awakening, it started to become more and more about awakening, which often happens. And then, and then it just became just purely um, sort of mentoring or whatever about awakening. That so that process just happened naturally. Um, but there's nothing here that feels like it's trying trying to save the world or help people to awaken. There's no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that energy that might have been there during earlier times where it's like really wanted to serve and to help and it was almost like like a very powerful force which was really beautiful that all dropped away as part of the awakening that was happening here and so it got to the point where I really couldn't say why I do it now now it's just that I just turn up and that's what I happen to be doing and I really don't care what that is it could be like last year I worked as a cleaner and I love that and so it's just it just, just happens to be what I'm doing now <laughs> talking about awakening and if that gets put down that's fine as well it's like all of the elements of trying to sort of find purpose and meaning um, which is a big part of this egoic structure here all of that dropped away and so with that is um, whatever is left here which is just I, I just happen to be doing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel you <clears throat> well said <clears throat> would you say there's uh i mean would you say there's like enjoyment or maybe more so of a just more flowing with life like less resistance to the to the flow of your individual movement throughout life like would you say that this is like i said before like just something natural you know just something that um Makes you happier, I guess, to put it simple. Would you say you, you get a sense of fulfillment from doing it? Or even that, you're just, it's just happening or in, you know, whatever happens, happens? Um, it doesn't, I can't really prioritize anymore. Like, it, it, there's enjoyment there for sure. I'd say what's enjoyable about it is when I work with someone and see um, that they're progressing or they get a technique or even just something like that. Um, that feels something about that feels quite magical, not because it's like, oh, I did that, but there's something in the air that feels very like, like it's remembering itself and it's like, Cling! it's like, it's got this like really nice feeling to it. Other than that, there's just, um, whatever I'm doing, I, it feels pretty even. That, that's the best way I can describe it. Whatever I'm doing, I have preferences still. Um, but whatever I'm doing is what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit hard to explain. I got you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Whatever you're doing is whatever you're doing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, how would you describe this? Um, I like to take things in the simple terms. Uh, so, 
this um i think kind of already touched upon this but i'm going to ask anyway the the non-dual perspective the awakening right the awakening out of the dream of the ego how would you explain to somebody why why as in like why i was gonna say why somebody would want this or what would be the benefits but i already know you might say that there's probably no benefits where you, you don't want this but there's i guess what i'm trying to get at is like people seek we're all seeking some kind of fulfillment right whether some people know it or not i guess in one way or the other i'm, I'm trying to say we're all on the path per se whether we know it or not um so why like what is what would you describe as like why what is lacking i guess even if we know we're lacking or not what would you say is lacking and why take this path like what is the is there a benefit to it is there something um is there something about it you, you know what i'm getting at like why would we why would we do these hours of meditation or listen to guidance from revered teachers do yoga self-inquiry from an outside point of view that doesn't know any better what's like why <laughs> you know mm -hmm. is there a why well i i guess it's just your time's up <laughs> you know it's mm -hmm. your timing you could say divine timing or however you want to put it in flowery terms but when it's your time it's your time that's that's how i see it and and although initially you probably won't perceive it that way um as it goes on you'll start to see that that is true through your own experience initially you might feel like i'm looking for happiness i'm looking for fulfillment i'm looking for purpose and meaning or however it is or i'm looking to end my suffering that's that's one of the main ones that brings people there and that's totally fine if that's that's how you're perceiving in those terms and that's what gets you there you know that's great it's fine but in reality over time you'll see that it's just it's just your time it's just your time it's your that part of consciousness is remembering that's what's happening and and then there's no stopping it yeah wow it's just your time mm-hmm and you can fight it or you can go along with it. So in a sense, there's a, a feeling of free will, even though ultimately there isn't, but there's a sense of you can drag the process out or you can get on board and that's totally fine, whatever you, whatever feels right. So it's, I like to talk in relative terms when people are perceiving from that, from a place of free, perceived free will and feeling like they're choosing awakening and, and that's cool. Like, I try to talk in those terms because that's how it feels. That's how it felt for me. It felt like um, that I was doing it. And then over time you see that it wasn't true and that's fine as well. You just see see the reality of it. Mm. Yeah, so you would say there's no free will, right? No, they ultimately no, but we... It, I sort of see it like at, as believing you're a separate person, as that is also an illusion, but with that comes the illusion of free will. It goes together. Oh. So while you believe you're separate, you also believe you have that you're choosing. Yeah. And so that's fine. You don't need to like push that away. You can go, that's just part of the, the deal here. <laughs> that's the deal. I feel like I'm choosing. And even though I might find out and or even intuitively sense that maybe that's not true, so maybe I can use my perceived free will to make good decisions, like yeah. to go meditate, you know, yeah. do self inquiry. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's trippy. Yeah, because I mean, at the absolute sense, you can say there's no free will, but there is a perceived free will. So, yeah, I guess that's just even even perceived free will is an illusion. But then yeah. one could say, like, is it though? I mean, if you're like, yeah, it, it is. I know what you mean. At the ultimate sense, I guess ultimately, right? There is. Would you say there is still a will though? And I, what I mean by will, 
not necessarily like an indiv individualistic will between Gary's will or your will or the listener's will, but there's like, in one way to say it, like the will of God or the, like the, and what I mean by will, it's almost like some kind of energetic happening in the illusion that we see in the, in the illusion in the happening that we may perceive in the movie screen of our life, there's still a will that seems to be happening. Um, even though it might not seem like it's coming from my noggin, my brain, it seems like there is like a, there's energy that moves forth, right? Um, at one sense. So would you say with this awakening into non-free will, there seems to be a, a variation or a difference in the orientation of just the energy itself of will, right? So what I'm trying to say, let me simplify my words, go back a little bit more. So from a separate node of this collective consciousness, um, from say my point of view or, or someone you know's point of view, looking at you or looking at somebody else who is on this path, would you say that our actions change with this newfound realization of what we are or what we're not. And even though it doesn't come from any kind of individualistic free will, it almost seems like it changes, like there is some kind of will change. And I don't even know if that's the right word to say, but there's some kind of changing of an orientation. Um, even, even, like I said, from somebody that's seemingly watching you that doesn't know any better from an outside point of view one may say like oh that person's more seems like a little bit lighter seems like a little bit more loving or a little bit more compassionate or their words they may speak a little bit differently like just something about the energy is different you know what i mean it may not be of our own our own accord but there may be something just different that dawns upon a seeming separate node of consciousness. Um, and where does it come from? Who Who is deciding the will? Is there anybody that's deciding it? I don't know, but there seems to be um, like, just like somebody, somebody's perceived energy can be different. Um, do you know what I'm getting at? Am I, am I, am I spewing nonsense here? <laughs> I think so. I'll talk and, and you can let me know if I'm on track. Um, okay. So my, my teacher, Adya Shanti, talks about will and I hadn't heard anyone else talk about will as a, like an energy. Um, so, mm -hmm. so this really comes from his teaching, but this is how I also experienced it myself. And that was that it went from a, a personal will or an egoic will or an individual will initially and I guess initially that was quite self-centered. Um, so that was like, what do I want? So that might be, um, you know, I want to get a good, a good body to go on a holiday or something, but that, that energy force to get you out the door running and going to the gym and whatever is the, the will. It actually is like an energy. Yeah. And so, but it's, it's, it's to serve at this, like a self concerned purpose which is fine it's not right or wrong it's just it starts there and then it becomes more about you know awakening and so it's like it it morphs but it's still like this energy towards i want to meditate i want to do self-inquiry i want to watch this teacher there's still an energy there but it's it's sort of changed the way that it's been used so it's still but it's still active but through awakening it starts to deplete and so that motivation and the um, even like I, I wanted to do all these things with my life and I wanted to learn to play an instrument and uh, had all these goals and all of that stops to drop away through the awakening process. And that can feel weird and um, concerning. You can actually feel like a lack of energy or a lack of motivation, but it's, it's actually a really good sign that, that the process is working because it's um, that energy force, it's the the egoic um, identification process that's that's actually dissolving. And so that is not enabling that same energy to do things 
to happen anymore. So the personal will. And so that transition happens where it goes from like this personal will to this, what can be called like a universal will or a divine will, mm. um, but something that's broader, you could say. And so that transition happens where that kicks in and that feels different to egoic will. And it feels like um, doing things like this, like wanting to talk about awakening and that's more the divine will. That's how I see it. Or like wanting to hold a satsang or wanting to feed the poor or you know, it doesn't have to be about awakening, but it's something about the collective. So that that becomes a lot more and it's like from this place of love and it doesn't want anything. It's not trying to get famous. It's like none of the egoic drive is there anymore. So it's a lot more loving and um I don't know, I guess pure, you could say. I don't know. I don't know what the right word would be, but it ha- certainly has a different feel to it. But it's still an energy force, and it's but it's just a very different energy force. And then the weirdest part is that as you go along through the unity process, which is the mind and heart awakening has happened, once you get to the end of the unity process, then that type of will actually goes as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's when you go into the no-self territory and with that no no will um there's no no will at all no personal will no universal will everything ends at that point and so yeah that's the process i'm going through is i I haven't finished completed that process but i'm going through the no self process now and it is it's like a lack of energy there's there's a lack of motivation and it's it's bizarre and you still can operate but it's like the body is doing it through conditioning Oh yeah. Instead of any type of motivation inside you going, oh, but I just need to do this. Like the smallest thing, it's um, it's quite a transition. It's probably one of the harder parts of this part of the process. Yeah, because it's, I mean, it almost is like dying before you die, right? It's almost like you're, yeah, I mean, you kind of are dying in a way, but it's not like in any kind of negative light. Um but it is, in a sense, you're 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 giving it all up while you're still here, or you're still here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I mean, yeah, that's tough to say the least. But I think ultimately, I mean, for lack of a better word, uh, it's worth it. Um, and what's it worth? I mean, ultimately, nothing. But I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> but it's um. Yeah, it's it's worth it. I don't know how else to say it, but that's, you know, yeah, it's your time. Like you said, it's your time. <laughs> so there's nothing that we could really do about it. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't know. Kind of at a, a loss for words right now, but I understand. I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> yeah. And I would also say on that note, um, with that, I mean, it sounds depressing, right? It, it for some reason it just sounds depressing. Like there's a lack of motivation, like a lack of, a lack of, uh, a lack of will, right? It mm-hmm. almost could ensue or connotate a uh, like a sense of inaction or yeah, just like a, a sense of depression. But I almost feel like it's the opposite. I don't, I don't think it's like that. At least from from an outside point of view, it's not quite like that. Like I've heard stories, if this means anything, I've heard stories of monks that describe um, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, after he was, quote, enlightened. And I guess he always, you know, I guess if you want to say he also attained this state, um, he always had a smile on his face. He was always just this joyous, just joyous figure. You know, he was obviously, he was the Buddha, just peaceful and joyous. Um yeah, so if that means anything to, to anybody listening, um, it's not like, it's not something where we lose ourselves in all is doom and gloom and darkness and the whole idea of dying before you die. That could be scary. I don't think, that, I think what I'm trying to get at is it's like, it's not scary. I don't know. If anything, it transcends the fear. And that's, if anything, that's why one may get inclined to be on this wavelength <laughs> because there's so much fear and there's so much suffering that one may only find we transcend when we transcend this sense of self. If anything, that might be a catalyst to find that joy. 
that lies on the other side. But yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. I think as we mature in our spiritual realization, it goes from, and it's totally fine wherever anyone's at. It's not a hierarchy thing, but it's just something that happens as part of the process. So most people sort of come to awakening to end their suffering. Mm-hmm. Most, not all, but that's that's the large part, and that's where I came through as well, and that's totally fine. It's a good driving force to keep you keep you on the path. It really works. So there's nothing wrong with that. But over time, that that desire to end suffering or to find happiness or meaning or whatever brought you there initially, that sort of starts to fade away in sort of these more raw and um, deeper drives, you could say, I don't know what the right word would be, start to appear. And, and they, they're things like, you know, truth, really. And that starts to, you start to just go, I just want to see truth. I want to see reality. I don't care what it looks like. I don't even care if it sucks. Yeah. I don't care. And and so, it gets to that, but that happens naturally. That's a natural process. It takes years usually. We don't we don't just one day go, yeah, I just want to see it for how it is. We're, we're initially, if we're honest with ourselves, it's like, no, I want I want my pain to stop. And it's like, okay, well, a lot of that will will drop away. So it's like, yeah, that's that's partly true. A lot of suffering will drop away. You will be happier. Yes, that is true. Mm-hmm. But then it goes deeper than that. It goes much deeper than that. And it's like, no, I just want to see what what reality actually is. I want to see it. I want to never be deluded for a second. I want to never, ever be able to move out of this present moment into a thought for a second. What would that be like? <laughs> yeah, that's unfathomable. Yeah. Yeah, and even having that question, what would that be like? It's like that's still, there, there is no, there, there is no like answering to that. You, you can't arrive at a question, what would that be like? But that is the essence. That is the <laughs> essence. Yeah, I know what you're getting at. And because the mind can't understand it, we can just point to figures like Buddha and whatever and make assumptions and say, well, they looked happy or whatever. But that's all just, yeah. that's to soothe the egoic concerns. That's all that's doing. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. If that's what you need with your life, where, where, wherever anyone's at, if that's what they need to feel better to get through whatever's happening, that is totally fine. But over time, you, you you move past that on the path and then you're like, I just want to see truth. I just want to see it all the way, 100%. Mm. I don't care what it looks like. I don't, I don't, I'm not caring about bliss. I'm not caring about happiness. And you go way past that. Yeah. You're like, I just want to see it for what it is. Show it to me. Mm-hmm. All set. Yeah. Happiness, Buddha, joy, peace, all labels. They're all just the fingers. Like I said, they're all symbols. Even truth, even truth, <laughs> it's truth beyond truth. But yeah, we're touching upon the essence. I know what you're saying. <clears throat> and yes, there is. And it's not to say, it does sound negative, you know, to say there's no meaning, there's no will there, there's no motivation. It's very hard to talk about it in a positive light, but that's because it's outside of, of language. That's not because it's bad. But the yeah, yeah. but the ego, the parts of the ego that are unhealed, the parts of that are there running that are like depressed or whatever will latch on to that and then go, Oh, what's the point of all this? and just throw it all away. And it's like it's not that either. Like it's it's just so easily misunderstood and misinterpreted when we talk about it, but yet, you know, it continues to want to talk about itself. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And here we are. Talk about it on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> it's very powerful stuff, to say the least. It's, um, yeah, very powerful stuff. Unwinding of the illusion of self. Uh, yeah, kind of at a loss for words. Rightfully so, I guess. <laughs> but it's like uh, I don't know. It's um Yeah, I don't know what to say. It's it's powerful stuff, but it's I think it's um it's the way, man. It's it's the way. I think it's the destiny of 
of the collective at this point. Um, maybe it is, maybe it's not, I don't know. I'll ask this question to you. Um, do, do you foresee this wavelength um, becoming more popular? Do you see? Do you foresee more people um, walking this path, this path, this pathless path? <laughs> like, do you see more people approaching you with inquiry and general uh, guidance in the coming years, in the coming months? Like, do you do you think this is this is going to become something that uh, humanity is just going to like? We're if this is truth, you know. If this is really the truth, per se, do you foresee us being able to reach said truth? Um, I'm not sure there's any way we could tell whether it's increasing in numbers um, because of there being so many people on the planet and being in the technology age as well where we have more access to the, the collective. So I, I'm not sure whether, say, you know, 1% was awakening a 1,000 years ago. I don't know if that's consistent and now there's just more people on the planet and it's still 1%. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Or we just have more access to because everyone was spread across the world not being able to communicate and now they're all we can all see all the people that are and be all connected. So I'm not sure if it's increasing or it's just the way that um, our modern culture is that it appears that way. I can't actually say. So I'm not sure. I don't really. Uh, I I couldn't say. I couldn't say whether it's increasing. I couldn't say if there's a reason because of the planet, you know, the Earth, the state of the Earth, or whatever. I I honestly wouldn't couldn't say about that. I don't have an opinion about that. Um, it just feels like this is what it it we do. We come into form. We go out of form, we come into form, we go out of form. That's that bit I can see. <laughs> Anything else would be like an overlay of like just an idea. Um, so I'm just not sure. Mm. I respect that answer. <laughs> I like that though. We come into form, go out of form, come into form, go out of form. For all of eternity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's peculiar. Come into form, go out of form. But it's almost like what we're doing now is we're coming, we're going out of form while we're in form. It's like we're becoming formless from the form. And what I mean by that is like the, the, the essence of dying before you die. It's like, yeah, I guess we, in a way, you go out of form when you leave the bodily vessel, um, I guess, maybe. Um, but it's like what we're doing, it seems to be like we're unraveling the form, the egoic individualistic self, from the ego individualistic self um at least that's what it looks like or that's where the the starting point it seems to be if there is a starting point i know there is that just implies like time that implies like starting and end point i know that that may seem contradictory but you know what i'm saying it's like it's like uh yeah i don't know it's like god became man so man can become god again um but it's like we're I don't know. I'm just like, why? why is it, I don't know. Maybe I'm just thinking about it too much. My my logic and rationale is just it's it's. Th I'm thinking out loud right now. And I think I'm I'm thinking a little too much about it. But it's I'm always like, why? Why is that? Why is it? Why is that the formula? You know, go into form, go out of form. Go into form, go out of form. And why are we going out of form while we're in the form at this point? Truly unanswerable questions. But I guess that's just a part of the self inquiry process for me, at least right now in this moment <laughs> it's fun to explore but you know we know that we we're not going to get a happy answer that that yeah. the mind feels satisfied about but it's certainly fun to explore how this all works and and then we just not know and then we just accept that we can't know yeah that's it that's it right there socrates figured that out and i know that i don't know that's the only thing to figure out is that truly we can't figure it out <laughs> And that's part of the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah, right? There's beauty in the paradox. Imagine if, yeah, if you could figure it out. If I could just snap my fingers right now and be like, I got it all figured out. No, that doesn't even make any sense. I wouldn't want that. I like the mystery. I revere the mystery. This divine mystery. 
Yeah, I wouldn't want to figure it all out. If I could. That doesn't even make any sense. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All we can do is just keep bringing it back to our own experience and like in our own inquiry. Like, is there a physical body here? Like, even that, when we inquire, when we really look, it's pretty hard to find. <laughs> yeah. So, simple things like that that we just sort of take for granted. Even yeah. that we can inquire into and go, really, is there anything here? Yeah. Is there really a world here? <laughs> truly. Is there truly another person there? These are all, this is how you can take inquiry even deeper mm -hmm. and more effective. And you can take it out into your day. That's what I recommend for people. I get a lot of clients that are just uh, busy with life and jobs and kids and, you know, typical people. And so we do processes that they can take awakening into their day. So it's not just like a practice that they do in the morning. And this is where you get real results. It's like take the inquiry out into the day. Is there really other people here? Truly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Explore it. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I think that's very apt. That's very useful because not all of us are monastics. Not all of us even do a meditation practice, but it seems to be like we – we our lives become the meditation in a way uh, the self inquiry is just it becomes it be just it becomes the self inquiry is not like you know it's time to do some self inquiry right now it, it just seems like yeah like the time is now to to do the self inquiry that's the hard part though you know when you're out in traffic and you got all the commotion of the so called world and the happenings and the phenomena that pop up but I think that if you if one can can question certain things about the world and others in the midst of the dream, I think that's really where um, that's where it gets potent. That's where it gets powerful. Um, yeah, I think that's really what it's all about, too. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah, I, I feel like there's okay, sorry. There's an important turning point that happens with people I've noticed where they go from it being like this part of my life is about awakening and then everything else is my normal life. That mm -hmm. might be how that they would describe it. And then somewhere along the line, they start to like cross over and then it just they start to see that it's all just about awakening and it like morphs sort of together and then yeah. all the practices come into just day to day. And it's not to say that you're always just, you know, trying to be present and whatever, but it's like there's, there's no longer like this is the, my time for awakening. It's just like life is awakening. It's about awakening. It's all here to show me, to illuminate to me what's true, you know, what's illusion. And um, and that's a big breakthrough for people when that, that shift happens, I find. Then things start to really pick up. Mm -hmm. I feel that. It's a merging. It's a subtle merging. Merging into the moment, the eternal moment. The infinite moment, just submerging. Mm -hmm. And life is always trying to show you. We're speaking about life like it's separate, and I get that. It's not, obviously. It's what we are. Yeah. But it is. It's always, it is what we are. And so it is trying to remember itself. That's what's happening. And so it's always giving you opportunities for healing, for letting go of illusion, for seeing your weak points for seeing your dysfunctional behaviours, for seeing your identities, for seeing your beliefs constantly, mm -hmm. constantly. It's just mo either we don't know how to look yet, we haven't learned how to look yet, learned how to understand it, or for a lot of us we're not willing to look mm -hmm. yet until we are. Yes. And then we can see the absolute opportunity and the, the gift in all the challenges that arise because we start to see oh, this is helping me with awakening right i get it now mm. well said mm -hmm. yep it's that classic adage i'm pretty sure we've all heard for anybody listening it's like um it goes from why is this happening to me to how is this happening for me it might be a different way to describe it you know how how are these things happening for me like you said what is the gift the gift is now the gift is always like you said i mean that may seem a little overwhelming to think about but it really is it's always always 
the opportunity, I guess one could say, for life to wake up to itself, for God to wake up to God, it's always, always. And it can be harsh. Yeah. You know, because if we talk about it in these terms, we can make it sound quite light. And it, it's just not. It can be brutal. Mm. Absolutely brutal. Mm -hmm. But it's still the same thing that's happening. It's still about awakening. Just because it's brutal doesn't mean something's gone wrong. Yeah, yeah. Or it doesn't, it doesn't mean that... Um, People can interpret it in all kinds of way, like, oh, this was my karma or whatever for, the, for this terrible thing, this accident or something to happen. But it's it's not it's not even it's not even that. It's it's when we're in something, it's very hard to see to see it, and we can go into our victim patterns. We can go into um, just the survival, trying to survive through something that's very difficult, and that's all totally fine. But once we're through the really hard parts of it, we can start to get a bigger perspective and go, why did this happen? You know, has this pattern happened before? Did this happen in my childhood? Is this a repeating pattern? We can start to get that perspective. But I just wanted to put out there that I know through ex lived experience how hard life can be. And sometimes you just got to put your head down and survive. But once you're through that, that sort of part, then it can be super useful to get that bigger perspective and sort of go, why do I think that this arose? What is it trying to show me? How is this helping with awakening? Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got to go through the darkness to get to the light. Might be another way to say it. Um, no, awakening doesn't get us out of anything. It doesn't get us out of hardships. It doesn't get us out of life. It doesn't get us out of this embodiment. It doesn't doesn't get us out of anything. In, in fact, it, it forces us to come fully into life. It does the opposite, to feel everything fully with no filter, to be forced to be present <laughs> mm -hmm. no matter what is happening. Very true. And so it's not a good sales pitch. Again, it sounds negative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think you said something like that, but like negative doesn't necessarily mean... Um, that is bad. Bad, yeah. <laughs> it's just hard to talk about it in positive terms, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, negative and positive, it's, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. It's, it, there's an equanimity that one can find between those two, those two seeming poles. What, what I say to clients when they sort of ask me about, is it just endless happiness and bliss and whatever, and I'm like, of course it's not. It's life. It's life. Being human is hard. Things are going to happen. You're going to get sick. People are going to die at the very least, at the very least. You're not going to just be going, oh, I feel so happy about that. That's ridiculous. Like yeah. you've got to be kind of realistic. So there is a human part that will be affected by life. But what I do say to clients is what I can say is that you never want to go back a step. Mm. You never want to, if someone said, just go back five years to your realization then, just go back six months, just go back a month. You would never, ever take it. So regardless of how challenging it is and all the illumination and all the steps you've got to jump through or whatever, I feel like that that's the best way I can explain it. You would never want to go back, though. Yeah. You would always happily embrace whatever challenge it is and, and not take a step backwards. So it's not the greatest sales pitch, but that's what I can offer. <laughs> I like that. That's good. That's good. I never heard anybody say it like that, but that's... That's something I'm going to remember. I like that. <sighs> you know what? On that note, I, I think we can probably wrap this thing up. Um, yeah, this was great. Do you have any anything else you want to say? Anything you want to say for the pod or you want to keep it at that? I think we covered a lot. That was cool. Yeah, came full circle on that one. Well, um, yeah, I appreciate your time, effort wisdom that you brought to this conversation with me and for anybody listening in the future uh yeah i thank you as well uh i don't hey i don't know what else to say like i said i'm kind of at a at a, at a speechless point right now but um well thanks for inviting me yeah of course that keep doing fun. your thing i wish <laughs> you all the best um yeah that's it keep doing your thing i wish you all the best <laughs> and yeah. thank you thanks guys 
All right. Peace, everybody.